Thank you so much, Ruth Ellen, for that uh, wonderful prelude this morning. Good morning and welcome to our worship on uh, Sunday, July the 12th. We're so glad that you've chosen to come and be a part of our worship service this day, joining with us online. Uh, we trust that God will bless you as you spend these next moments with us here together as we come from the uh, sanctuary at Chadburn Baptist Church. There's just a few announcements that I would call your attention to. Uh, obviously, I uh, hope everyone received the call from me the uh, first part of this past week uh, regarding our worship schedule. Uh, as you know, uh, a couple of weeks ago, our deacon group felt like we were uh, things had settled down to where we could uh, start coming back into our sanctuary uh, today. Uh, but uh, since we made that decision, the uh, number of uh, uh, diagnosed cases has more than doubled in our county uh, and in the places all around us. And uh, with keeping safety in mind, uh, the uh, deacons believe that we uh, need to continue just doing what we're doing. Uh, we'll be uh, continuing to have a drive-up service that will be streamlined uh, on Sunday mornings at uh, 9.30. Uh, they will, but we will be posting a full-blown worship service like we've been doing uh, on Sundays at 11 o'clock on YouTube as well. So if you want to come and have an abbreviated uh, kind of service uh, because of the heat and humidity, uh, or if you want to stay home and uh, watch a full-blown service, or you might want to do both. It's all, it's all up to you uh, for you to decide. We're going to keep that uh, schedule in place through the end of July. Of course, we're going to continue to meet and talk and uh, look and see how things are going and uh, try to make the appropriate decisions, uh, keeping everybody's uh, safety in mind. And once again, we'll just make the plea, if you have not received uh, uh, phone calls from me, uh, at least once a week, please uh, call the church office and give us your uh, correct phone number. We're using only the numbers that we have, and I know that uh, uh, some of those are, are behind because folks have switched from landlines to uh, uh, cell phones. And if you would just please make sure uh, that you would uh, let us know what your actual number is, the way best to catch up with you, we would certainly appreciate that. Now as we begin our worship, listen to our scripture passage. Jesus is speaking in Matthew chapter 13. We'll be reading verses 1 through 9. Matthew 13, 1 through 9. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying... A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, but because the soil was shallow, when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still another seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Great God, we pray that you would sow us like your seeds on the winds of your purpose, that you might put us in those places where we might grow in fertile ground, Lord, keep our lives from those stony paths where the heat of life's cares and strife take our strength and our vitality. Protect us from those thorny places where the snares of life's worries and fears blot out the sunshine of your spirit. Place us safely in rich soil. Bless us with the gentle rain that our faith may grow and increase and that our joy in you might be complete and total. For it's in the name of Christ that we offer this prayer. Amen. Allow me to wish you a good morning as well. And as Brother David has shared in his scripture, that some seed fell on good ground. Our opening hymn is going to be entitled, Holy Ground. Let us sing these two verses together. Oh, 
Thank you so much, David. We come to that uh, time in our service that we've set aside to uh, spend a few moments with our children. So we'd ask our children to uh, look and listen up uh, a little closely in these next few minutes, if, if you will. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see what I have here in my hand from the camera up there. What do you think that is, Anthony? Can you see that at all? Looks like sunflower seeds, I hope because that's what it is. I, I've got a bunch of sunflower seeds here. I don't know if you like sunflower seeds or not. I like to eat them. But uh, suppose that I wanted to have some sunflowers, and I just took uh, these couple of handfuls of sunflower seeds, and if I just walked out the door there in the front of the church and just started throwing the seeds everywhere, uh, what do you think would happen? Well, some of them would maybe land on the porch or on our brick walkway out there, uh, and those seeds would probably be gobbled up pretty quickly by the birds because birds like sunflower seeds too. Uh, I could toss them somewhere maybe uh, where uh, there might be more rocks and gravel. Uh, same thing, there might be a little more dirt there. Uh, maybe it might grow just a little bit, but it wouldn't grow enough to truly grow and have a beautiful sunflower. Uh, there might be other places that uh, I could go that were off on the edge, and there might be weeds and, and uh, less sunshine there. And the seed might struggle. It might grow a little bit, but it never really would grow very well because uh, its, its roots would be choked out and wouldn't have this kind of sunlight that it needed. But uh, if I were lucky and got some of it in, in, in a good sunny part of the, uh, of the yard out there where there was some uh, plenty of sunshine and plenty of water and, and plenty of uh, opportunity for it to put its roots down, uh, the seed would really grow and it would have a wonderful uh, experience. We'd be able to see beautiful sunflowers in, in the appropriate time. And Jesus told a story like that to uh, some of his friends and those that were uh, gathering around to live listen to him and as he was talking about uh, this farmer who went out and he was just taking his seed in his hand he was just throwing it everywhere that he was going wherever he went um, he really Jesus really wasn't talking about uh, sowing seeds uh, uh, G he was talking about the words of God and the words of God need to fall on good soil uh, for him to take root. Now, how do we become good soil? By listening. Uh, just doing what I asked you to do a few moments ago, to sit up a little uh, uh, more erect and listen to the, uh, to the uh, words that I'm saying, listening and, and paying attention. Uh, and it's important for us uh, to pay attention. In fact, that's the point of Jesus' story, that we need to, uh, we need to have good soil by uh, listening attentively to the things that God has to say to us. Now, you're old enough now probably to realize that God can speak to us in a lot of different ways and not always with words. Sometimes God speaks to us in the beauty of the sunset, a uh, beautiful rainbow after the rain, through the kindness uh, of another person. But we won't ever hear if we're not listening. Uh, it's so important for us to listen. Has anybody ever said, hey, get your attention, you need to listen, listen. Uh, I've had folks say that to me. Usually it was my parents uh, when I was growing up because I needed to pay attention, and, and I sometimes didn't pay attention. But uh, it's important for us as we grow and as we learn uh, to pay attention particularly uh, to the lessons that we get in church, to the lessons that we get uh, from the scriptures, the lessons that we get from Jesus himself, because his whole goal is to make us uh, the uh, better uh, followers of, of his, uh, that we might be the type of people uh, that are pleasing to God. So let's take a moment and say a word of thanks. Dear God, we thank you for giving us ears to hear your words, eyes to see your words, hands to feel your words. Thank you for making us good soil in which your words and your love can sprout and grow and help us to share that good fruit with those that are all around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Every teacher I ever had from the earliest to Sunday school, I got finger clicked like that because I wasn't paying attention. But uh, I hope that uh, for the next few moments, 
you'll be paying attention as I share some uh, needs that we surely would like to have you pray for. Uh, both Brother David and I attended a pastor's conference uh, a few days back, and uh, we were listening to the prayer needs there. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Brother Titus Carraway, some of you may know who he is. Uh, his grandson tested positive for COVID-19, and uh, he and his wife, Miss Edith, uh, they are looking after the grandchildren. And so uh, we really want to be in prayer for them. Uh, Brother Dave Heller, our associational uh, director of missions, he is having an eye procedure this week and next week, so we want to be in prayer for him too. Spoke to Michael Shaw today. He's doing great. He's in good spirits when I'm talking with him. And uh, it's always good when you've got some praise report uh, to share at this time. Uh, remember our shut-ins. Uh, there are a lot of folks that we're used to seeing, but we're just not seeing them now. And for safety purposes or whatever, uh, we shouldn't forget about them. And if we can't come into close contact with them, we ought to at least give them a call and let them know that we're thinking about them. I know that they would love to hear from, from us, so if you've got a moment or two, uh, reach out and call somebody. I'm, I'm sure they would appreciate it and be blessed by it. Uh, Elaine Honeycutt told me that uh, Brother Jerome is back uh, at the hospital in Charlotte and... Uh, is seeing a back specialist and she also went on to tell me that uh, baby Wyatt is doing fine as is his brothers and parents uh, but continue to pray for them as well and a friend of Ruth Ellen and mine Glennis Mincy uh, the Mincy family uh, were friends of ours from our previous church and uh, some of you may know uh, Miss Glennis's husband Larry Mincy uh, I spoke with brother Larry today and Miss Glennis is in the hospital at Chapel Hill, and she has been diagnosed with leukemia. I wish that I had more to share about that, but uh, I was really pulling this from Brother Larry. But uh, your prayers would mean an awful lot, uh, not just for the Mincy family, but for those that I have mentioned. And let us go to God our Father right now, because he anxiously awaits to hear our prayers. God, we thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace, for your healing hand that has shown itself to be so true. Lord, we are in prayer for those that are having a rough time in hospitals, and it's not just the person in the hospital, but it's the families. Because things have changed, we can't spend time with them like we'd like. I just ask for a sense of peace to help them. Lord, we're very excited for the praise reports that we have received. We give you all the glory. And we thank you. Lord, for our shut-ins. We just don't see them quite as often as perhaps we may used to, but Lord, lay a burden on our heart that we need to reach out and speak to them and let them know that we haven't forgotten you. It's just so easy to be overwhelmed these days, and we just want to reach out and see how you're doing. Lord, we're so grateful for all that you do the things that we know and the things we do not know. I ask a special blessing upon our pastor and the word that you have given him that he will share with us. And I ask you to bless me as I share this message of music the way you would have it shared. These things we ask in your name. Amen. You know, I'm going to go ahead and say by way of introduction. Uh, if there's anybody out there that would like to sing and stand here, uh, I would welcome you with open arms. 
and probably a lot of the people who tune in and watch the broadcast would be just as grateful. That being said, uh, the song that I have fits well any time of the year, and it's a wonderful bit of instruction to us and a wonderful blessing reminder. It's called Reach Out to Jesus. so much Dave we certainly appreciate that also Joyce as you accompanied him as well come to that time in our service where we uh, uh, remember uh, those uh, opportunities that we have to give uh, many have uh, continued to be faithful and uh, turning their uh, mailing their uh, offering in we certainly appreciate that and we honor that uh, in these moments let's bow for a word of prayer Heavenly Father again we are grateful knowing that you are always working in our lives, that you are always giving us so many good and wonderful things. And Lord, we thank you that you give us opportunity in, in our, as a part of our worship uh, to be able to return a portion to uh, you in the building of your kingdom. Lord, we pray that you would bless each gift, that you would use the gifts uh, not only to grow us towards spiritual maturity, but also to build your kingdom. We ask these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Our scripture text uh, continues along from Matthew chapter 13, verses 18 through 23, as Jesus goes on a little bit later and explains the parable uh, that he told uh, the sower in the uh, early part of Matthew 13. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word at, and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth Choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, 
yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. May the Lord bless to our hearts and to our minds this portion of the written word today. Farmers are some of the most resourceful people around. Uh, they have a dedication and a wisdom that comes from working hard as they work their land. I uh, ran across a list of wise sayings attributed to farmers uh, and see if you can pick up on their wisdom as well. Maybe you can even relate to one of these. Uh, the first one is keep skunks, bankers, and lawyers always at a safe distance. Number two, forgive your enemies. It messes up their heads. Number three, do not corner something that you know is meaner than you are. Number four, life is simpler when you plow around the stump. Number five, when you wallow with pigs, expect to get dirty. And this last bit of advice I think is highly important. Always drink upstream from the herd. Jesus told lots of stories, and he told lots of stories about farmers. And today's text is one of those stories. However, the farmer in the story doesn't seem to be a particularly gifted uh, a farmer, does he? He goes out to sow a seed, and, uh, and Jesus says as he was scattering the seed, it just kind of went everywhere. Some on the path, uh, some on rocky ground, some on deficient soil, some among the thorns, and only some of it uh, got to a spot where it could actually grow. Uh, those are the kinds of things that, that uh, most folks know, whether they're farmers or not, that you don't plant seeds where people are going to be walking uh, because it never grows, uh, and the seed won't penetrate the hard soil. Uh, you don't plant seed in rocky places where there's not enough soil uh, because the plants might grow real quick, but they're not going to last because there's not enough soil there uh, to support any type of a life-giving root system. Others uh, fell among thorns, which Jesus said uh, just sort of choked the life out of those plants. And by this point, the, arm, the uh, farmer in Jesus' story is 0 for 3. Uh, he's going to be hungry uh, when harvest time comes this year. He won't have much to do, but he's going to end up being hungry. Finally, however... Uh, he hits the right spot. Some of the seed falls on good soil where it produces a good miraculous crop up to a hundred times what was sown. Certainly won't be a bad year after all when good seed falls on good soil. Amazing things can happen. Robert Schuller uh, used to say anyone can count the seeds in an apple but only God can count the number of apples in a seed. That's the greatest things in this world, how the kingdom of God starts maybe from something just tiny, as Jesus had talked about earlier, just as small as maybe a mustard seed. Uh, big things can happen from small beginnings. And of course, the story that we would normally refer to as the parable of the sower, as we learn, is not really about farming at all. It's not about a careless farmer but a story about a generous, giving God who sows seeds of love and grace everywhere. But different kinds of people respond in different ways to that offer of love and acceptance. Jesus describes them as, as different kinds of soil. Usually try to have uh, three points as we move through our uh, sermon time. Today we have four. Sometimes they don't have any points. It's a pointless sermon. Uh, but today we've got one more because Jesus used one more. Uh, the hard soil, the rocky soil, the thorny soil, and the good soil. But some people he described as hard soil. Uh, this is the seed along the path. Now you may think Jesus is here talking about maybe atheists and agnostics, but, but not necessarily. John Huffman tells a man he knows by the name of Bob. Bob's in his mid-60s, and Bob has gone to church all of his life, and he thinks of himself as being a, a pretty religious man. He's never let his religion get in the way of his lifestyle, but he goes pretty regularly. He considers himself a good churchman, He's probably sitting in church somewhere right now if his church is open, listening to a sermon somewhere. But he likes to be the one that's in control of his life. He hears the gospel every Sunday, but the seed never really penetrates the soil of his heart. 
Very few of the values that he hears in church are translated into actual living, day-to-day living in Bob's life. Bob knows what he wants, and very little of it uh, fits the claims of Jesus on his time or his life. And like most Americans, Bob worships at the altar of Bob. Bob's problem is that he's committed himself to himself instead of Jesus Christ. Bob is his own Lord. He's the king of his own life. He gets turned off by preaching that quotes too much from the Bible. He wants uh, something comforting that's uh, kind of psychologically agreeable uh, to what he likes. And make no mention of sin or anything like that because that kind of talk went out of style in the Middle Ages, according to Bob. And he gets turned off by anything that might urge him out of his comfort zone as he worships Bob. You see, Bob's going to go to church, and it's like an inoculation for a contagious disease. He's gotten just enough of it in him to keep it from being effective and catching the real thing. And that's so sad. There are many, many people who live like Bob. He's hardened to the gospel. He's not an atheist or an agnostic. In fact, Bob's probably a bit more hopeless because Bob has no apparent awareness or feels any sense of need to respond to God differently than what he does every Sunday, week in and week out, filling his place in the pew. Bob's like a soldier. I was reading about a soldier as a sergeant, a real hard case, and the chaplain had been talking to him for weeks about his relationship to God, but the chaplain wasn't making much headway. Uh, and the uh, sergeant and some others got together for a volleyball game. And when the, uh, they were in the middle of the play, the sergeant took his shirt off to play the game. And the chaplain said he couldn't help but notice that this hard sergeant had the Lord's Prayer tattooed in large letters right across his broad chest. Every word, every letter, everything was perfect. And he thought as he walked away from that volleyball game, the Lord's Prayer is all over the outside, but obviously the message has never gone any deeper than his skin. Now we can't always judge by outward appearance who has hardened their heart toward God, but this is the seed that's sown along the path. There's a second group, a rocky soil people, uh, people who had faith at one time, But it really wasn't all that solid. It really wasn't all that firmly rooted, and they let it slip away, or rather, they slipped away. And we can feel great compassion for some of these people. One of the most tragic stories is that of Tom Sutherland. At one time, Tom was an upstanding Christian, an elder in his home church, uh, but that was before he was uh, uh, taken captive in, uh, in Lebanon for six and a half years. And he said during his captivity, he was held in 26 different locations. Some of his cells were cold, dark, underground, six foot by six foot holes. And after 18 months of captivity, he was put in solitary underground cell. He said he became so discouraged that he tried to commit suicide three different times by putting a plastic bag over his head that every time after a few moments, he would think of his wife and his three daughters and he would stop short of taking his life. Thankfully, Tom's a free man today. However, one casualty to his experience in Lebanon is that Tom no longer believes in God. And when asked why, he answered, I prayed so many times, so hard, so hard I prayed, and nothing happened. Certainly, we can feel compassion For folks like Tom Sutherland, you and I don't know how we would react to such a terrible, horrible experience. However, we do know that there are others who've gone through the same sort of experience and came out strengthened in their faith, not weakened by that experience. Jevi Levine, a Middle East bureau chief for CNN, was taken captive in Lebanon, and he not only held on to his faith, but he learned how to pray even for his captors and to forgive them the things that they did to him. Different people respond to life in different ways, different soils. Some of us leave very sheltered lives, but one day we'll have a test that will come along. Maybe we'll lose someone we love or fall on hard times or go through a pandemic. 
uh, we'll find out whether our faith is rooted in good soil, good enough to sustain us. But the seed falling on rocky ground refers to somebody who hears it and is joyful about it, but since they have no root, it only lasts a short time. When trouble or persecution comes, they quickly fall away. There's a third type of, uh, of ground that's talked about, and that's a seed that fell among the thorns. It refers to Christians who've let worldly concerns, such as material things that Jesus mentions specifically, choke out their faith. Maybe Jesus could be talking about a lot of us here in America. We live in a very materialistic society, and there are some who believe that they can buy their way to uh, happiness uh, and, and have simply good life. Others believe uh, somehow we are superior to those that don't have quite as much as we do, maybe because we've worked harder and we've earned it. But whatever the uh, thoughtfulness that's going on in our minds, the seed that falls among the thorns may be the largest group in our land. Maybe you remember uh, the uh, pop singer Madonna, uh, the material girl that she sort of named herself through one of her very popular songs. Well, she's 61 years old now. Uh, and in an interview, she said, you know, as Americans, we're completely obsessed and wrapped up in a lot of the wrong values. Values like looking good and having cash in the bank, being perceived as rich and famous and successful. Folks, if somebody like the material girl Madonna can see what's taking place in our country, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? It's sad that there's a segment of our society who truly worships those material things more than anything else. A number of years ago, there was a, a, a research uh, uh, from the uh, Pew Research Center uh, did a poll asking people what their uh, goals in life were. And according to that particular poll, 81% of the young people uh, between ages 18 and 25 said that getting rich was their most important or second most important goal in life. There's nothing wrong with making good money and those kinds of things, but uh, when that's your number one or number two goal in life, that's a pretty hollow uh, type of foundation on which to build a life, isn't it? In his book, uh, a biography uh, that he wrote about himself, Just As I Am, Billy Graham tells a story that speaks to this issue. He and his wife Ruth were uh, visiting an island in the Caribbean, and one of the wealthiest men in the world heard that they were there and invited them to come to his lavish home and have lunch. This wealthy man at that time was 75 years old, and throughout the entire meal, he was close to tears. In fact, he confessed, I am the most miserable man in the world. Out there is my yacht. I can go anywhere I want to. I have a private plane. I have helicopters. I have everything I want to make my life happy, and yet I am as miserable as hell. Billy said that he and Ruth listened to this wealthy man. They talked to him about trying to point him toward a relationship with Jesus Christ that would give his life purpose and direction and meaning. And later on, as they left the man's home, they went down to the small cottage where they were staying. And that afternoon, the pastor of a local Baptist church came to call. He was actually an Englishman, and he too was 75 years old. He was a widower. And he was spending most of his time taking care of his two invalid sisters. And yet, Billy said this Baptist pastor was full of enthusiasm and love for Christ and others. And in fact, he went on to say after hearing that he had spent time with the man who was so fabulously wealthy, he said, you know, I don't have two pounds to my name, but I think I'm the happiest man on this island. And after he left, Billy and his wife Ruth uh, 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 thought about that and wondered which was the wealthiest man in, on that island. They didn't have to answer because they both knew the answer. It was the one who had the solid relationship with Jesus Christ because the stuff of this world, no matter how high and deep the pile is, is not enough to fill the hole in our heart that can only be filled by a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
Some of the seeds fell on the path where the soil was hard. It was eaten by birds. Some on the rocky soil that uh, didn't give it the opportunity to establish firm roots. Some falls among the thorny, thorns of worldly concerns like material wealth that just simply chokes out the seed of, the, of God. But some of the seed falls on good soil, said Jesus, and here is the good news for the day. Sometimes the message of the kingdom falls upon hearts that are prepared and welcome it. And when good seed falls on good soil, great things can happen. He says, seeds really are miraculous, aren't they? Consider the, the potential of one kernel of corn. A kernel of corn is uh, buried in the soil and it will produce a corn stalk. And each stalk produces an ear of corn and the average ear of corn has 250 kernels so that a single kernel of corn in the right conditions can yield a 250% investment uh, return on that investment. And we need to be reminded that when good seed falls on good soil in God's world, in God's economy, a wondrous things can happen, and it just takes a tiny beginning. Last week we celebrated Independence Day, and we celebrated how much our freedom means to us as best we can uh, in, a, in, a, in a, a time when our freedom has been a bit limited. But we have this freedom that we enjoy because of some amazing people like Thomas Jefferson and John Madison and George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, uh, many others who planted seeds in this new world, the seeds of democracy and human rights. And from those seeds sprang up a nation. And that's how it works. Good seed sown on good soil and God works miracles. Of course, since we're talking about God's seed, sometimes it even will uh, fall on unpromising soil and it will still produce abundantly where we could least expect it. Many of you are familiar with Mother Teresa of Calcutta, missionary to India. Uh, she's uh, sadly re uh, uh, passed away. But who would, looking at her life when she first began, have ever thought that anybody besides her mom and dad and maybe a few of her friends would even know what her name was? She didn't have much to recommend herself. She was a tiny little woman. She didn't have much. She became a nun, which means she had even less. And one day she uh, went, went to her superiors and said, I have saved three pennies. And I have a, three, a dream from God to build an orphanage in India. Mother Teresa, her superior, said, You can't build an orphanage with three pennies. With three pennies, you can't do anything. I know, she said, smiling like we all became familiar with that wonderful smile. She smiled and said, Yes, but with God and three pennies, I can do anything. I can do anything if God is with me. Mother Teresa understood that principle of the seed. It takes very little, but very little, blessed by God, and in the place that God wants it to be, can cause amazing things to happen. And this is what Jesus talked about in the a parable of the mustard seed, that uh, it's a tiny, tiny, little bitty seed, but if it's planted in the right spot, an enormous bush can grow enough that even the birds can nest in it and you can get some shade from it. And that's the way that God works in his world, that he starts small, but big things can happen. Back in 1986, Natalie Sleeth wrote a hymn titled simply, Hymn of Promise. And in the first verse, she writes these words, In the bulb there is a flower, in the seed an apple tree. In cocoons, a hidden promise, butterflies will soon be free. In the cold and snow of winter, there's a spring that waits to be, unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. Now, Natalie Sleeth was a church musician. Sadly, she passed away in 1992, but she wrote those words as a part of an anthem that she dedicated to her husband, Ronald, who was a well-known seminary professor who taught the art of preaching, homiletics. And uh, at his request, it was sung at his funeral. 
a song of hope and promise. As long as there is a seed, no matter how tiny or promising, uh, unpromising, there is hope. Of course, in Jesus' parable, God is the sower of the seed, and we are the soil. And this day, Jesus would have us look within and ask us, what kind of soil is in our heart? Have we become so hardened by self-preoccupation like Bob that the seed can't possibly penetrate our hard hearts? Are there rocks in our soil that keep the roots shallow so it will not stand a time of testing? Are there worldly thorns like the love of material things that might choke the life out of our spiritual devotion? Or do we have receptive hearts? prepared to go and do what God would have us to go and do. God wants to plant that seed in our lives today. We ask that question, is the soil ready? Natalie's song continues, There's a song in every silence, seeking word and melody. There's a dawn in every darkness, bringing hope to you and me. From the past will come the future, what it holds a mystery, unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we are grateful that you work in our lives in ways that are beyond our ability to calculate. You call us to be faithful. And in our faithfulness to you, you are able to do things that are beyond our imagination. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to make sure that uh, we have prepared our hearts as best we can, that we might truly be those people that you can use to make a difference in this world. And we offer this prayer in and through the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The closing hymn happens to be the very hymn that Brother David spoke of just a few moments ago that Natalie Sleeth wrote, Hymn of Promise. And it may be new to you, but I'd like to think that you will catch on very quick as we sing it together. Let us bow for prayer. 
Heavenly Father, again, we are grateful for this opportunity of worship to gather uh, electronically with our brothers and sisters, knowing that we are indeed in your presence. Lord, whenever we hear the truth of your word proclaimed, we know that you have promised that uh, it is not a useless event, that it is something that you can bless. Lord, this day we, play, we pray that you would bless your word to our hearts and pray that our hearts would be the type of soil that would welcome the truth of your words. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you and go in peace.